Hi, welcome to Some of Your Parts Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Betsy Greenleaf, premier pelvic health expert and women's wellness warrior. Join me as we discuss women's wellness topics and discuss tips and tricks with top elite health experts and where you'll discover that you're greater than the sum of your parts. As part of our continuing COVID coronavirus extra bonus episodes, we'll be having with us today, Dr. Joan Rosenberg. Dr. Joan Rosenberg, PhD, is the creator of Emotional Mastery and Emotional Mastery Training. She's a highly regarded expert psychologist, master clinician, trainer, and consultant. As a cutting-edge psychologist who is known as an innovative thinker, trainer, and speaker, Joan has shared her life-changing ideas and models for emotional mastery, change, and personal growth in professional and education seminars, psychotherapy sessions, and graduate psychology teaching. She is a featured expert in the critically acclaimed documentary films, I Am, and The Hidden Epidemic. She's also been seen on CNN's America's Morning Show, the Oprah Winfrey Network, and PBS stations nationally, along with other appearances across TV, radio, and print media. She is the founder and creator of the Emotional Mastery, the only systemized emotional training and conditioning approach that teaches lay persons, mental health clinicians alike, how to foster unwavering emotional strength, self-confidence, and self-esteem. She serves on the John Asaraf Scientific Advisory Board, has one patent in performance skill development, and is a published author. I'd like to welcome with me today, Dr. Joan Rosenberg. Thank you, Dr. Rosenberg, for being with us today. Uh, That's a treat. Thank you so much for having me. So you have an expertise in building confidence and resilience. I think now during coronavirus, this is probably more important than it is. I mean, it's so important in our regular lives, but even now when we're just all facing this uncertainty and so many of us just want to stay in our pajamas all day long, Uh Uh what what do you think is really important for us to kind of start with at this point in time with being in quarantine and uncertainty and you know, for me, it's actually breaking down a little bit about what this is about. Um, and and the part of the way I make sense of what's happening is that we're actually in a time of profound loss. Yeah. And and as a result, profound grief. And it's combined with the the not only this uh, insidious virus, uh, but it's the economic downturn at the same time. And, and it's a rare moment that we're all asked to be still. And, and so the interesting thing is, depending on, uh, the, the way I think about it is, depending on how well-resourced one is and what one's attitudes are, this could also be a time of uh, perhaps also pr- profound transformation. It's, it, it could be awakening moments for us. So... Um, but it's so that, that that's kind of my starting point. And it's not with any kind of intention to be somber. It's just it's really just to acknowledge the reality of what is and not make much more of it than to start with going, OK, this is what is. So I have to stay present to to that. Um, and and again, we're stripped of face to face contact or uh, literally face to face contact, uh, human touch, uh, depending on who you're living with or living without. <laughs> there's um, losses of anticipated events. There's loss of walking in nature. There's, I mean, I, it, it becomes pretty innumerable to mention, but it also it also touches on the more uh, the more ephemeral kinds of things because we have a loss of a sense of stability or a loss of predictability and loss of a sense of um, security. So, so it's again not not with any intention to be somber, but it this is what it is. Sure. And, you know, I've heard before, especially it being brought up around now, is that like life isn't uncertain. It's just that now it's being kind of shoved in our face and we're all going through it simultaneously. Where before you could kind of, even though life was uncertain, you, you could kind of predict the way things were going to go. Right, right. Well, the, you know, in, and actually we, we were just talking earlier about, about my book, 90 Seconds to a Life You Love. Towards the end of the book, and I actually did a podcast on this five years ago, I talk about anything can happen at any time. And, and, so, and, and I talk about us having a false sense of, of security, that, that we, we believe everything is secure. And to your point about uncertainty, that's true. 
the, the, but here's how I cast it. And, and if people can kind of wrap their heads around it, then I think it can make a difference. Most people will talk about this time as uh, where they're feeling fearful or they're feeling anxious. And if a person is well-resourced, meaning they have shelter, they have food, they have family and friends, they have those connections that they can turn to, they have finances, um, you know, they're not on the edge, then, then my thing is, please don't use the word fear. Again, because uh, uh, I'm going to give us a different word to use around this. And, and so the, the, the idea, because fear, fear from psychology standpoint is danger in the moment right now. So if you're actually not in danger in the moment right now, don't use the word fear because it activates your system. It's right, well, the words we use make a difference on how we feel. There's a, as a friend of mine likes to talk about, there's a vibration to them. So let's choose a more appropriate word. Well, the next most logical one is, is feeling anxious. And that's what most of us would, would say. And again, does it fit? Yeah, it fits. Because again, psychology's point of view is that that's, that's worry or concern over a bad event happening in the future. Okay, totally fits. Except if I ask 10 people what anxiety meant to them, I'd get 10 different answers. So for me, it's like way too vague and ephemeral and it's up in the clouds. And, and, and so the word I prefer, and it's, it's part of my work, because uh, I talk about eight unpleasant feelings, but the, the, the word I prefer of those eight is that it, we're vulnerable. We're actually feeling vulnerable. And, and what's different about this is that it's not that we weren't vulnerable before. We've always been vulnerable, but most of us don't maintain either the awareness of that vulnerability or we don't maintain or experience the sense, the physical sense of that vulnerability. So what's different about this time, so if you think about vulnerability as, oh, I could get hurt, then I think it more accurately describes what's going on. I could get hurt relative to the virus. I could get hurt relative to the economic downturn, um, So, or, or in, in directly or indirectly by both of those things. And that that now what's happened, and this is where I get a little nerdy about it. Now what's happened is not all, not only are we legitimately more vulnerable, meaning insidious invisible virus, who catches it, which direction does it go, and plus the economic downturn. So two very legitimate concerns about about vulnerability, but we have the experience, the felt sense of being vulnerable. And this is where my, my, uh, my nerdy act comes in, is that now if we're actually awake enough to it, we have the awareness that we feel vulnerable. And if you let me take it one step further, yeah. so I hope this doesn't put me too far out on the limb. No, go ahead. Not only, not only do we have the awareness that we're vulnerable, but but there's if we're awake even one step more, then we have an awareness that part of what has changed for us is the degree to which we are aware we're vulnerable. I hope that all makes sense. No, it does. But I was thinking, you know, I find maybe from people that I've talked to that there's this tendency to want to ignore the vulnerability and kind of push it away and be like, I don't see it. I don't hear it. I'm just going to, you know, kind of either pretend that life is normal or I'm going to just kind of go into this little cocoon and just tune out everything and stay in my pajamas. And <laughs> Right. I, well, I would agree with you. I totally agree with you. I mean, uh, my, my thing is always about awareness as opposed to avoidance and distraction. So, so yes. I, I agree with you 100%. The challenge is it sets somebody else, it sets someone up to have uh, the same or a worse experience the next time around. So that, so that the, the beauty, actually, there's a real gift in the vulnerability. And, I, and I, when we choose into being vulnerable, I think it's, it's a strength for everybody. So, so there's also a way to look at, at vulnerability as a real strength. But the, the beauty of actually being aware of your vulnerability is it makes you awake to life in a whole different way. 
it, it, you know, there's a, there's a, it's like, oh, wait a minute. I've got limited time here. Let me be more conscious about my choices. Do I really want to be doing this thing or do I want to be doing something else? So it, it, it heightens your, the, the capacity for you to consciously choose into actually going the direction you would love. So, so for me, that's why I think it's, it, it's a great, it's, this time is not only uh, a challenging time, but if we want to be really reflective and awake, it can be a very transformative time. And I've seen that too. I've seen people where they've posted that, you know, they were going, going, going. And now that they're forced to stay still, they've gone, wait a minute, do I really want to go back to that life that I had before where I was working, you know, these ridiculous hours, not spending time with my family? Exactly. So, exactly. And that's part of what I'm talking about that, you know, I, I wrote a, a, a list out very early on <coughs> of like, Eight, eight C's to guide us in terms of what we could do during this time. Yeah. And, and one, of, one of them was contemplation. So, so, so to your point, yes, it's, it's being reflective and going, wait a minute, we're, I'm, I'm still now. And, and stillness brings about surfaces, stuff we don't, we've not wanted to look at, which could include like past stuff that's not been dealt with too. But but the the beauty of it is somebody can go, oh, wait a minute, what is it that I value here? And and I, let me be more conscious about choosing into my values. Now we're making great use of the time. What, you know, once we have that awareness, what are there certain other steps that we should be doing or just do you sit with that awareness and then, and then things kind of come to you? Like, because I think like, I find myself like wanting to be proactive. I'm like, okay, what can I do? What can I do next? You know, and you know, I want to know like, what are the right steps for people to be taking? Well, um, you know what I would, well, what I would say is I think that I think taking time to be reflective or contemplative is important. So I would have people journaling or I would have them engaged in, in important conversations with people that are important to them, whether it, whether it be close friends or whether it be a, a partner. And, and it's like, let, like, let's, let's talk this through, you know, this is what's surfacing for me. And, and so it's, for me, it's about being in the being before you're in the doing. Sure. Right. So it's, it's like, let me, let me get clear. You know, I haven't liked, I haven't liked having to do the commute or, or I didn't like all the hours I was away from my kids to your point, or again, or, you know what, I actually don't enjoy what I'm doing. I wonder if I can take the same set of skills and do something else. Or we're, we're at home, I'm still working from home. How can I creatively set up a better schedule for myself going forward? Because I actually love being at home with my family. So, so it, the, the first part of it is really to get clear on, on what you would love. It's like, what, what's, what, what do you value? What do you love? Um, and, and then what I've actually started to tell people to do, because they're working remote, is to build in, and, and I, I borrow this from a colleague of mine, uh, that she talks about using a calendar as a personal development tool, which I love. And, and so the idea is that you, you put on that calendar what you, it's like the calendar doesn't tell you what you're doing. You tell the calendar what you're doing. And most of us don't think that way. Yeah. And, and so so the, the, what you put on that calendar is what you would love first. So, so I, I was talk, just talking to somebody yesterday and I suggested that he said he's loving reading and he's, there was something else that he picked up as like a musical skill that he, he started to go back to. And a friend, another friend's gone back to painting, things like that. I was, so what I said is since you're working from home, Build in what you would love first. He's taking long walks with his wife in the morning. Okay, build that in. Um, now, now build in the, your reading time. Now build in your guitar time. You're very conscientious. You're going to get your work done. Now put in your work. So build in the stuff that you would love first. Because that's the stuff that's going to nourish you anyway. You're going to do your work. You're super conscientious now, but now building your work time. I like that. Cause I find myself doing the opposite. I'm like, I'm like, I got to get the work done before I can enjoy myself versus you're saying you'd probably be more productive if you did the things you like first. 
or, or built them in and you place them throughout the day. Yeah. Right. So the walk, the walk with his wife is taking precedence. Great. Okay. Put your reading time in the afternoon then. Who cares? Yeah. That, yeah. Those, those are some great suggestions. I've noticed that you've been blogging too about things, you know, ideas to do it might be like keeping a schedule during this time. Yeah. Yeah. So the, yeah, the, so the C's, if I can remember all of them started with, uh, what did it start with? I have to go. Look, I, have to, I have to kind of go look and find my cheat sheet. But uh, I should be able to remember most of them. Um, uh, one had to do with um, monitoring your chi, so your energy. So uh, that gets at all the stuff that's out of my wheelhouse. But I I do my best to practice. So that's it's sleep, it's um, sunlight, it's supplements, it's meditation, it's exercise, it's great nutrition all the things that take care of our physical well-being. So, uh, so that that would be the, the first one. Uh, th- then I talk about doing things that, um, that are, um, are completion. So if there's old projects or decluttering or doing those kinds of things, uh, the, the, those open loops, those unfinished projects, take away our energy anyway. Uh, this is a great time to to engage in completion. So, uh, so that you you're going back to old things that you want to close the loops on. Uh, another one is uh, creativity. So, so again, as much as we're closing loops, this is also a time of creativity, uh, and uh, or being cur- curious and creative. I think is the way I wrote it. And and the curious and creative would be uh, this is a great time to learn a new language. It's a great time to learn a new skill. Uh, like I said, others are going back to old creative endeavors, playing music. Um, so a friend of mine is doing watercolors now. Uh, she used to do watercolors years ago, but now she's bringing that thing back into her life. Uh, contemplation, I've mentioned. Uh, it's also, a, this, is, this is physical distance. This is not social distance. This is physical distance. So let's get the wording a little bit more accurate. It's physical distance, but it for me, it's oh, this is underlined plus social connection. So this is also a time of, of staying well connected to others. That might include uh, either asking for help, which I consider a part of emotional strength, or it may be um, just reaching out, checking on a neighbor, making sure people are fed, well fed, all those kinds of things. Uh, so, so then think kind of connection community. So lots of different people are in different communities. I know people are having all sorts of parties on, on Zoom or they're having different meetings on Zoom or whatever, the family connections. Uh, I know people did the Passover Seder. I'm sure they did the Easter celebration, probably across Zoom as well. So, so, it, the, so connection, community. And then if you're well-resourced, as I was talking about before, then it's contribution. So, uh, so that there's, uh, I'm, I think I missed one, but that's most of them. And but so that there's any number of different things that one can do. Those are all such great suggestions and things I haven't even thought of before. So, you know, I also wanted to ask you, I think, you know, your book probably really it, it pertains to things now too, with building resistance and confidence. What are the things that we could do to, to, build confidence during this time? You know, uh, my whole, uh, the body of my work is centered around being able to, to experience and move through eight unpleasant feelings. And, and I, I wrestled uh, early in my life because I was a shy introvert, I wouldn't say, well, shy child, sensitive child, bullied as a kid, uh, didn't feel like I fit in, all those kinds of things. And, and you can imagine where my confidence wasn't, actually. So... <laughs> So the first question that I wrestled with when I was very young is, how does somebody develop confidence? Because I realized, it, I, if, even if I wanted to go stand by my peers, that con- confidence was not contagious, and I was not going to be able to absorb it from them. So, I, and, and I wanted what I perceived they had. So that was the kind of the first question that I, I started with. And then as I got into my professional life and started to work with clients, then the next big one that, that kind of emerged was, what makes it so difficult for people to handle unpleasant feelings? Yeah. And it turns out, as, uh, as the years have progressed, that, um, and the way I've made sense of, of both of those questions, is that the, 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 second, the answer to the second question, 
about about how one handles unpleasant feelings is actually the foundational answer to the first question about confidence. So, so the part of the way I think about confidence, and the, the, the way I've defined it in the book, is that it's the deep sense that we can handle the emotional outcome. So I would underline that. The deep sense that we can handle the emotional outcome of whatever we face or whatever we pursue. And, and that's, so, the, so what's the foundational element of confidence and what's the foundational element of, resist, of resilience? It's being, it's, it's being able to experience and move through eight unpleasant feelings. And, what are the, and yeah, what are the eight unpleasant feelings? They're sadness, shame, helplessness, anger, vulnerability, embarrassment, disappointment, and frustration. Mm. And again, why these eight? Because they're the most common, everyday, spontaneous reactions to things turning out the way we we didn't want or, or didn't or they didn't turn out the way we perceived we needed it to turn out so so it's it's cuz the everydayness of them um, and so so that's so uh, our our capacity to experience and move those those feelings is the again like i said is the foundation of confidence and the foundation of resilience uh what else goes into resilience um the ability to ask for help. So I think of that first one as being capable, asking for help as someone being resourceful. So I, I, I really see asking for help as a crucial part of resilience. Uh, I also believe that, um, I mean, we can add in things like um, faith, meditation, journaling, prayer, um, all those kinds of elements as res- things that help with resilience. Uh, but, but I also very strongly believe in what I call, would call resilience thinking or resilience ad, resilience re, resilient attitudes. So for this time, for instance, uh, a, resi- a resilience kind of question that we can be asking that will help promote that for us is, are questions like, um, "What? Uh, how can I take every life experience and turning it in, turn it into a learning experience?" So how could, in that case, how can I take this COVID-19 related experience, this stillness, this quiet, how can I turn this into a great learning experience for me? Or another written great resilient kind of question is, how can I use this time to bring out the best in me? Or how can I use this time to transform me in a, in a way that I would love? Right. So, so we can ask questions. They're going to pr- promote our own growth and our own well-being. Then there's there's um, attitudes like optimism. So there's uh, uh, having a sense of humor. Uh, again, I'm talking about realistic, taking things realistically, but also maintaining the optimism. Uh, it's holding. It's not being as caught up in the circumstances, the conditions of what's going on right now, but holding a vision for a, a, a great future for yourself. So that that helps us um, pull out of the condition and go for the long term vision. So there's there's countless different things we can do. I think I in the book I think there's a resilience checklist that has probably twenty or twenty five items on it. That because people have all this extra time, that books are awesome things to be doing right now. So I would definitely tell people you know if you got some time and looking for a butt get your book. So. <laughs> Thank you. That's very kind. Yeah, yeah. 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 But, but that's, so those are, um, another one is that, that, um, you know what I, uh, think back on, on difficult times that you've been through before where you've persevered and it was successful and then take the strengths that you identified from that and, and bring that forward into right now. So what, what strengths do you have from before? that helped you persevere through a tough time. So again, there's, there's so much that makes up a difference in, in, in building and sustaining that resilience. Typically, I guess my question is for women, um, and I don't know if it's, if it's my view of life or I, I've seen other people kind of like, or like this, but I feel like I was brought <laughs> where, even though now we celebrate confident women, I think that my growing up where you weren't supposed to be confident like that was you were coming you were kind of come across as being like a jerk if you were a woman that was confident 
So you see that there's a difference in in like confidence and men view confidence and how men view confidence. A lot of stuff. So um, <laughs> the uh, I don't know when someone's confident, it is not boastful. Okay. So that that, that if somebody's boastful, they're not confident. Yes, maybe that's what I'm I'm interpreting. Yes. Con- confidence is not boastful. Yes. One exudes confidence by one's beatenness. So so and and again, so I come back to the definition. If I have yes. a deep if I have a deep sense that I can handle the emotional outcome of things not turning out my way, there's nothing I have to do to tell you how great I am. It's not about that. Yeah. Right? And you'll experience my, the kind of who I am just by being around me. I, I don't have to tell you that I'm such and such. If you ask, and, and, I, and, the, and, I, and I say, well, you know what? I'm really good at X, and I tell you one or two times, that's healthy confidence, being able to tell the truth, right? Like I'm really good at tennis or guitar or clinical work or what, it doesn't matter what it is, right? But if I have to tell you 17 times, then it's not confidence, it's the opposite. That, right? that makes a lot more sense because I think I was kind of misinterpreting <coughs> confidence and boastful and kind of, and kind of marrying those terminologies together because I know here I am, I'm a physician, Right. But I have pretty much gone through my life as a physician and have hidden that because I was afraid that people would think I was being boastful and I no. was embarrassed and almost shameful of my accomplishments because I was afraid of people thinking that was being boastful. So now I kind of see the difference. No, in fact, in fact, I think of telling the truth of of who you are being that's that, t- telling the truth of who you are is actually humility mm. you know there, there at one point i was working with a client and she was playing down all sorts of accomplishments and and it's like i looked at her and i said who are you and what gives you the right to play that down we're, wow. we're that's arrogance that's arrogance to think that you can play down who you are. That's it's a whole switch on the paradigm. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, I just got chills. So, <laughs> yeah. So, so, and the way I talk about it in the book, telling the truth about your accomplishments or being complimented for them is one of the ways you seal in confidence. Hmm. So if you dismiss compliments or you dismiss the yes. accomplishments, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. You actually never have a chance to update your self-image. Wow. So in my mind, it's cr- that actually accepting compliments and telling the truth of who you are is a crucial part of sustaining that unwavering self-confidence. So uh, it's like, uh, so kind of what I want to say to you is sister, own it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You've you've got you've done great as a physician. Well, one that you're a physician. Two that you've done great as a physician. Three that you've got all sorts of accomplishments. It's like rock on, own it. Yeah. But but what ends up happening when you own it is all you do is exude more of you. Again, it's not like you have to go tell everybody, "Hey, I'm great." Yeah. That's not what happens. Yeah. That's not what happens. It gets exuded out of you. Comes out of yourselves. That's amazing. That's a great way to look at that. I never really thought about it like that before. So this is wonderful (laughs) stuff. I mean, not only is that going to help me, I think it's going to help other people to think of it like that. Yeah, no, it's it's, uh, right. Because I do see that a lot, especially amongst my friends. They kind of downplay what they do and it's kind of like, you know, I that, women that, are like, eh, you know, it's no big deal. It's you know. uh, and 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 that and and what I would say is that that's actually toxic to us. Yeah, I um I have six major ways 
that I talk about in the 90 seconds book of, of the way people develop confidence. So it's really, if there's, if people always talk about it, you need confidence, you need confidence, how do you do it? Most people don't, can't describe a how to, the yeah. book is really a how to, and, and literally changes people. Um, and, and the beauty of it, I mean, that's the feedback I'm getting. You just get a couple of the concepts. They're major, they're paradigm changers. Um, again, I'm, this is what I've been told. So, and, yeah. I, and I've watched it work over, uh, over two and a half decades or more. So the, but the, the point that I was going to say is that um, accepting compliments is a, a major way of helping up your confidence. Because I see compliments as a reflection of you back to you. Oh, wow. Okay. So it's not being pulled out of the ether or out of the blue. It's someone's giving you a compliment based on their experience with you or their experience of you. So it's coming out of an engaged experience. And it's so obviously their, different than someone who's like fishing for compliments. I think that's been always my problem with compliments is like, oh, like I, you don't need to compliment me. Like, like a feeling like, oh, that I like asked for it and then feeling guilt behind. That's well, that's the, then that get, that would take a, take me to harsh self-criticism, which I also see as a distraction from unpleasant feelings. Mm. So so there's to there's toxic things going on. There's things that really rob you of being as fully you as you can be if that if those or, or other women if that's taking place. Yeah. Yeah. So it sounds like I need to read the book. Other people need to read the book. Read the book. <laughs> <laughs> all, everything I'm telling you is in the book. That's true. Yeah. Actually. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So is there anything else that you can think of that I haven't asked you for what we could be doing with ourselves right now while we're in quarantine and dealing with all these unpleasant feelings? Yes. Yes, I think there are. There so a couple different things. Um, be gentle and compassionate with yourself and with others. It's, it's a hard time for all of us. And we're all in it together. So um, so uh, allow yourself to feel the compassion. Um, and again, especially if you're well-resourced, allow yourself to feel the c compassion, uh, and, and where you can contribute based on that, but, um, but be compassionate. It's, and you know, the, the uh, second thing that I think people don't talk about as much as, um, as much as this loss is being, uh, the loss and grief or the grief is being evoked by the loss. I think we have all sorts of reactions to um, feeling helpless to be able to do much about it. And I would layer on not just the, um, not just the virus, not just the economic downturn. I would also say the political situation as well. Mm, yeah. That, that um, there's a, so helplessness, when helplessness gets evoked, people move into kind of more depressive or despairing places or they get really angry. So, so when you're seeing lots of mood shifts, irritability, mood shifts, rage, anger, and it's kind of, um, it's a little bit more explosive or a little bit less contained, I think it's a reaction a lot to the helplessness and the grief. And, and grief, I think of as sadness, helplessness, anger, and disappointment. So, uh, at the minimum. So... It, it's again have compassion be gentle especially because all of this is going on and with the helplessness you can take action taking action tends to push back against helplessness and the other thing i would say is be in community because being well connected to others makes a big difference in terms of uh, not feeling so alone with what's going on um, we're we're social beings we were designed for this um, so the other is so so think of compassion, gentleness, and community as um, being really other important things to consider during this time. Yeah, I think everyone's had to get a little bit more creative with the social interactions, which I'm <coughs> loving. I'm loving to see the creativity with these Zoom parties, and uh, I have two young girls. They're um, 
10 and 12. And, you know, in the past, I didn't want them on their tablets or phones and communicating with their friends. And they're like, looking at me like I'm crazy. I'm like, no, I want you to get, call your friends, like get on a web, you know, right. whether it's right. Google That's Hangouts right. or Zoom. Like, I'm like, you guys don't understand how important it is. And they keep looking at me like, what? Are you the same mom? I'm like, no, like you need to do this, but. Uh, yeah, right. This is, this is the COVID mom. This is not yes. the, uh, this is not the everyday mom. So. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's exactly. It's just so yeah. important for us to all remain connected. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. I, so where can people find out more about you and your book? The book can be found anywhere you buy books. So Amazon, Barnes and Noble. I know there's a new place that came out that's, uh, uh, the, it's trying to help the local bookstores stay sustained, I, I, but I don't remember the name of it. Um, so anywhere you buy books, you can find my book, 90 Seconds to a Life You Love. And uh, even Costco and Target, I think. the um, You can find me at drjohnrosenberg.com. Uh, and if people actually want to uh, access a free PDF download of my Ease Your Anxiety book, um, they can go to drjohnrosenberg.com forward slash anxiety dash reset. And I'm a lot of places on the internet. I, um, so I, I, there's two TED Talks. Yeah. So people can go to YouTube for those TED Talks. And I've done lots and lots of interviews. So um, you type my name and you can probably find me with, there's a Psychology Today blog. Um, so I'm just, I'm, there's a lot of stuff out there. So Great. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. I'm honored. Today's episode was brought to you by the Pelvic Floor Store, your source for personal health. You can find us at www.pelvicfloorstore.com. For more information on today's episode and women's wellness, please go to drbetsygreenleaf.com. Yeah.